Hello, everybody. This is Graham. And this is Dean. And we are doing our top 100 games of all time. So this is our first uh, episode, video, whatever else. This is going to be from 100 through 91. And nice little splash screens and everything. And you can see Dean and I. So I'm on this side, waving. Dean, if you can wave to your side. Look at look at that enthusiasm. So uh, I put all the slides together. So I know Dean's list, but Dean doesn't know my list. So that's just Seems. so. Yeah, I mean, it's just so I get my my ribbing kind of all prepared. So he will have any comments he have are are, are going to be completely off the cuff for Dean. A lot of pressure. Yeah, a lot of pressure. So um, I guess this is. Our top 100 games as of May 2020. This has changed. I originally did my top 100 list last January. And it's changed a fair bit between then and now. What about you? Do you do yours every year? How do you do yours? Do you have like a running top 100 and you just kind of modify it? Or do you throw that one out and start from scratch again? Uh, I, I throw it out and start from scratch. And I usually do mine around January. Whenever I have a chance. Usually when I'm on the road. Um, I'm sitting in a hotel room and I do mine based off of, um, it sounds archaic cause I'm sure yours is much more, um, modern, but I have, um, I have every game that I own, every game that I've ever played, each of them listed on an index card. And then I go through the, the index cards and put them in, in a top 100, move them around, shuffle them around. Now, obviously I already have the, the original 100, the one from last year stacked together so i'll put new ones in and then over the course of the year as a as i play new games i'll make new cards and i'll stick them in a stack um so i know for sure that i've played them uh, yeah, a lot of them are never going to make the list but it's still it's still kind of nice to see them all stacked up so uh how do your ratings or do the do your ratings on board game geek come into a play for your top 100 do you compare like you have a 9 or 10 rated game on board game geek you guarantee that that's like within your top 10 or do you ignore the, what you previously rated it? And when you go through your, your process of doing it, you're just looking at the game going, Oh yeah, I remember liking that one and kind of putting that where you think it belongs. Yeah. I don't worry. I mean, I, I when it comes to what I rated them on BGG, that doesn't influence where they're going to fall on my top 100 because originally when I started doing my top 100, I think I made my first list back maybe in 2016 um, my rule was I had to have played that game um, within the last two years. And if I hadn't played it within the last two years, then it wasn't eligible to be in my top 100. And then I made the the exemption of if it made the top 100 two years in a row, then it could always be eligible for it, even if I hadn't played it within the last two years. But what I have found is that if I haven't been playing the game, no matter what I've rated it, there's a chance it may not be on the list because... I, I don't know. It's, you know, it's fresh in my mind, that sort of thing. And then there are some that drop off just because I haven't played them. But, you know, I could I could have a game that's a favorite to play that's higher than what it probably should be based on what it's rated on BGG. But I'm rating the BGG based on what I think of the game design as well as how much I enjoy it. Whereas my top 100 is my favorite, which there could be some crappy games that I like that are my favorites. Yeah, I... I don't believe I have any crappy games in my top 100, but um, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely okay. going to be some games on my top 100 that um, maybe aren't my normal style of game, but it's just one that I seem to enjoy for whatever reason. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, we'll get right into it. People will see as the games go along. I can tell you that my my list is uh, very Euro heavy, especially when I was looking at my top 20 to 30, 40 games. I think almost all my games in the top 30 to 40 are all Euro games. Kind of your midweight to heavier Euro games. So, which means I threw all the party games <laughs> at the 100 through uh, 91. So, why don't we get into it? So, sure. uh, the, our first one is going to be top 100. And I'm, I've put all these, so Dean's going to go first and I'm going to do the second one. So, Dean, you're number 100. All right, my number 100, again... <laughs> This is kind of a, an example of what we just talked about. This is a game that I've talked a lot about on podcasts. I've spent a ton of money on this game, <laughs> but I just haven't gotten to play it that much. So it's consistently dropped over the years. So my number 100 is Heroes of Normandy. I still enjoy the game. Um, you know, it's a nice tactical World War II game. 
Uh, it's it's a beautifully um, produced. It's nice thick cardboard. Uh, the art on it is, is very caricaturesque, but it's more of a Hollywood version of World War II. The thing I, that I enjoy about it is that all the information you need is either printed on the map board or printed on the actual chits with the symbology. It, it, you know exactly what you can and cannot do. And so, yeah, so there's going to be a little bit of dice rolling, but it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. But it's not a, it's not a simple game. There's a lot of stuff going on in it. But it, depending on the scenario you're playing, you know, it's you know, it, it could be more difficult than not. But, yeah, that's put out by Yellow and i know it plays two players it probably plays more than that i've never played it more than that but uh heroes of normandy and i don't know if you um if you track yours over the over the years or how often you've made your list but i i will say that in 2016 this game peaked at number 32 on my list and then steadily dropped 32 to 44 to 72 to now number 100 i don't know will it stay on next year i guess i should get it played maybe <laughs> I, I pulled off all the, the box cover for the this uh, little recording, and the box cover says that this is a two-player-only game. Okay. So I've never played this game, but this is the game that I love razzing Dean over because he spent a whole bunch of money on Kickstarter to get boxes, and I don't know what else you bought, some storage stuff for a couple hundred dollars. So um, I've never played it. How So how heavy is it? It says that the box says it plays in 30 minutes. Is that about correct? I think it depends on, I mean, probably it depends on the scenario you're playing. Um, yeah, it's not a long game. I mean, it's, it's not a combat commander. It's not going to take that long and it's, uh, definitely not that, um, that difficult. I mean, I don't know what it's ranked on BGG up top of my head, but I would think may, I mean, it's definitely under a three and it might be, uh, you know, it might be like a two and a half. Let me right. see here real quick. I, I can tell you cause I got them all pulled up. So Heroes of Normandy is a 2.75, 30 to 60 minutes. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is one of, the, one of these games, one time when we get together that I will have to actually play this game with you. Oh, then I'll have to dig it all out and take it <laughs> yeah. out of stream, and all the I wanna, extra stuff. So I want to play with all of it. I want you to open every single box. <laughs> I have to rent a U-Haul to get it to Canada. Okay, so my number 99 is a... My two-player game, this is called uh, Babel, put up by Uwe Rosenberg. And this is a game that is always said that if you want to uh, have a game that you play with your partner to see whether they like confrontational games or t uh, not so much take that, but really nasty games, try Bab uh, Babel. It is a mean game it's about building up the pyramids uh, and building up kind of monuments. And you are fighting over each uh, construction area. But you have some special abilities that you can do. And one of the nastiest ones is you can play, I forget which, which set of cards it is, but you can play a set of cards that will have the other person lose half of their cards or destroy their monument and things like that. So, okay, so you destroy the monument or you lose half your cards and like, oh, fine, I'll, I'll kind of build back up to it. Then I can do it again and you lose, you know, the next half of your cards. It is very mean. Uh, it is an older game. The version I have is from Z-Man Games, as you see on the screen here. But yeah, when I first heard about this, I was kind of nervous playing this with uh, with my wife, Lella, because, you know, sometimes people just don't like games which are that confrontational. And I can, not only can I take stuff away from you, I can stop you kind of halfway through building it or just say, oh, you know, you built the that, that many cards, they're all half gone. Your hand that you can, you know, hopefully try and get back into the game, those are gone too. It's like I said, it's just really mean and nasty. It's not something people normally associate with Uwe Rosenberg. You know, normally thinking of, you know, Agricola or Caverna or, you know, Feast of Odin, which very euro -y games. This is a lot more confrontational. That is my number 99, Babel. Have you ever played yeah, Babel? This is one of those, you know, I haven't, but I think I own it, but I can't remember. Because um, I know I bought a couple of those little Cosmos two player games. I think I got them down at the dice tower off of Tom when he was selling stuff. And I think Babel might've been one, but I'm not sure. Cause I thought the one I had had like Jaguars on the front. So maybe no, I'm thinking of a different one. Yes. I know the version I have, uh, shows like some guy on a horseback and a, you know, bow and arrow guy, basically the ones I have on the screen here, though, there was the, uh, the Jaguar pyramid that was put up by Cosmo as well. That was, um, but that's not nearly as confrontational as 
Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I know I haven't played it, but I, I want to say I own it, but I may not. So. Okay. Well, that's so not move. a that's not a party game. No, it's not. It might, I can't remember if I do have a party game in my top 10. So unlike Dean, because I'm running the, the software, I know what's on my top 100, but I'm not exactly sure the order because I, I did these slides earlier, so I can't remember the uh-huh. exact order. Okay, so we go on to 99, and Dean's number 99 is... My number 99 is a classic, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's I'm a just... classic in, in, in modern gaming, and that is Marvel Dice Masters by WizKids. Uh, again, a game that I've talked about, a game that I haven't played hardly at all uh, in the last couple of years. I still enjoy it. I just never got into the whole tournament aspect. I never got into the building uh, building decks or teams or whatever you want to call it. I've built a few, and there's, you know, I'll play them over and over again. But I like playing my games historically based off of the comics uh, and the teams that are involved. So it's a it's a dice, uh, I guess you call it a bag building, dice building game where you're, you know, you're putting dice in the in the bag. You're trying to to pull out, get some build up certain characters so they have better abilities, better powers. You can team people together depending on the, the version you're playing. If you like Marvel Comics, if you like bag building games, if you like a little bit of deck construction, it might be something that you're interested in. I, I actually didn't know they were still making the product because I haven't played it in forever and you never hear really anyone talking about it. But, um, you know, you could probably pick it up pretty cheap on the aftermarket if you wanted to dip your toe into it and just see what it's like. Or I'm sure there's plenty of people that have it that don't get to play it, that if you said, hey, I'd like to play it, I'm sure they'd be thrilled to get it to the table and and play it again. So that's Marvel Dice Masters, my number 99. Another one that keeps falling, 31 to 66. And then it went back up to 63, but now down to 99. Yeah, this is one I have, uh, I've never played. I have a crap load of this stuff. I have the Avengers versus X-Men. I think the complete uh, card set, because if people haven't played Dice Masters, there's the dice. So on the screen, I have the Avengers versus X-Men, which I believe is one of the first ones, or either the first Mm -hmm. or the second set that they came out with. And you see all the dice in there, but you also have cards. So you'll have like uh, Cyclops and Captain America and Spider-Man cards. And the cards will tell you what to do, but there are, I believe there are three ranges of each card. So there's like a common, uncommon, and rare. Um, and the rare one will be, like for Spider-Man, it could be the black costume Spider-Man as opposed to the normal red one. Those type of things. So I actually have a complete set of all those cards for uh, Avengers vs. X-Men. I have multiples of all the dice. I could probably have a tournament in my house the amount of dice I have for this game but I've never played it. Uh, the only reason why I have so much is because one of my local stores, when the next set was coming out, they did a massive uh, Boxing Day sales, sale right after Christmas, and you could get a gravity feed. I think he was selling them for 30 bucks for gravity feed. That's and, pretty good. And I just went, okay, I'll buy one of those. And they also had another large volume of set that they were th- basically selling off dirt, dirt cheap. So I went, okay, because I know Lala has always liked Quarriers. This is the... Dice Masters is based on Quarrier, so I figured uh, she might like it. I've just never got it to the table. So one of these days, you know, Dean will truck his Dice Masters, I will truck my Dice Masters, and we'll have this huge tournament with all these dice and whatever. I I think, I mean, I have so many extra dice um, just based off the number of sets I have and buying multiple uh, gravity feeds that... Um, I, I could reenact that scene that you see uh, the meme on on social media with the dice truck that overturned on the highway. <laughs> I, I think I could do that. I actually had contemplated just filling up some uh, some jars and containers with all the extra dice just to to have kind of as a an object of art, but <laughs> I never did. Okay, so my number ninety nine is maybe on the very opposite scale of Dean's. So Dean's Dice Masters is pretty light. My number ninety nine is Dungeon Pets uh, by Vlada Shavatel. <laughs> Um, this is, I guess, a sequel to Dungeon Lords, uh, but I, I much, much prefer Dungeon Pets. Dungeon Pets is about raising the pets or the, you know, the, the monsters that go in dungeons and your goal is to keep the, the cages clean and to get new monsters and to clean up all the poop that comes after them, you know, going to the black market is kind of your standard Euro game. And I think one of the problems with 
this game, as much as I love it, and the reason why it's kind of lower is because it it has a fairly um, high level, high barrier to entry, because it's not a straightforward Euro game. And the rules, a lot of Lado Travadal's uh, games tend to have a rule book that once you know how to play, the rule book works well. But learning how to play is a little, little bit more difficult. This is one I actually haven't played in a while. Uh, but one that kind of sits on my shelf and I love the theme of it. I like the look of this game and it's just a kind of a fun heavier Euro game. So that is my number 99 dungeon pets. That's a, that's one that I haven't played and I've, I hear good things about it. I mean, people talk about it all the time and give it pretty rave reviews. Um, but it's one that I don't think I'd ever get played if I owned it. So I'll have yeah. to play it at a convention or or something like that. But it looks cool. I mean, the the, the art on it's really nice. So, all right, my number ninety eight is a game that I don't own, but it's a game that we used to play pretty frequently. Dan and I and, and the group uh, that we played with, um, Dan would even take it to conventions. But that was a that was a um, his blown up version of it, his kind of pimped out version with die cast models and everything else. But the game is Race Formula ninety. And that was put out by Gotha Games. It's a German company. I don't know how popular the game ever was in the United States. But if you like Formula One racing, think of it as a Formula One racing version of uh, Thunder Alley. It's very similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Um, and you know, like I said, Dan pimped his out with the big die cast models and, and everything else. That's the only way I've ever really played it. And it does make it much more memorable. So that may have a factor into why it's... It's in a top 100 list, but this is one that if you if you play Thunder Alley, you'll get the game. If you like Formula Racing better than the NASCAR racing, you'd love the game. And it's it's not I mean it's not hard, but it's not not simplistic either. There's there's quite a few things going on with the card play and and some different you know managing your tires and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's 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 a good time. I know Graham didn't enjoy it because I was. I want well, to say I taught the rules. I'm not <laughs> sure what that experience was, but um, yeah, Race Formula 90 by Gotha Games. I, I was chuckling to myself as you were talking of how the um, the game is not overly complicated. And you had the hardest time trying to teach me this game. Now, well, to be, because I've granted, never, I never taught it. Yeah. And I've also, to be, played it. And, and to be fair, I mean, we were you were trying to teach me at a convention, and I always find teaching games at a conventions, you know, with the noise and kind of everything that's going on, it's not as inducive uh unless you can find a little quiet area which we didn't so i'll, I'll give you the benefit got, of the doubt got, right and then you've got people staring at you the whole time as you're trying to read the rule book and <laughs> you know i had no prep time okay so mine is actually a newer game it's a little card game called animal kingdoms uh this is funny because it came up in one of our last uh, podcasts when we were talking about abstract strategy games this is actually listed as an abstract strategy game and i'm not exactly sure why but animal kingdoms is a kind of a, a neat idea in which you have uh it's kind of a circular board and each board is kind of split up to different uh triangles like a piece of pie and each piece of pie has different number of little spaces on it and during the, the course of the game you want to be putting your player pieces on those spaces as soon as the last space is filled up, basically that section is closed, and I believe the la the person who puts the last one on there, or the sort of the majority, will then move up to kind of have a city in that area. It's played over three rounds, but how you play cards there is at the beginning of the round, you're going to lay out cards in front of each piece of pie that says how you can play cards there. Like there must be ascending. So if if Dean plays a two, then someone else would have to play a three on top of it. So you couldn't play one, you can play another two, or it could be you can only play even cards, or you know, you can only play blue cards, that type of thing. So once everybody is done, and once you have claimed an area, you're out of the round. So yes, you can kind of race to, to kind of get the area, because each area is also going to be worth a different number of points. But yes, you can maybe race to get the, the claim, the high point area, but then you're out of the round. And if it's a multiplayer game, you know, it's kind of this push and pull of how many other areas do you want to be in to try and get maybe second place to try and get some points versus I want to claim this high point area and be out of the round. Once the round is over, you see who has the majority, you score points, move the, move the winner up to the, I think it's the winner, or yeah, move them up to the city. And that, if you move your thing up to a city, you automatically start the next round with, with basically one point in that territory. 
you remove all the cards that tell you how to play, deal out another set of cards, deal out cards to each person, and then you start again doing the same type of thing. After three rounds, whoever has the most points is the winner. I really like the idea of those changing requirements for each section and that push and pull of when do you pull the trigger to seal off an area so you get the maximum points, but then you're out of the round. And it really changes with the number of players. Like a three-player game is a lot different than like a four to five-player game. I think it goes up to five. I know I've played it with four. And I found the four very different from the three because the three, if you get out too early, you're leaving a lot to the other players. So, so they will then basically go after all the other areas and then make sure that they're not, because they, until they're full, they don't shut down. So I really enjoy this one. So this is my 97, I guess. I think we're 98. 97. 98? Yes, this is, sorry, this is my number 98, Animal Kingdoms. Yeah, um, so I know you, you've talked about this game before in the past, and I actually bought it based off of that discussion. The fact that it made your top 100 makes me feel a little better about buying it. I just don't know. I think it may just be a little too much going on for my family to get into it, though. So I'm a little worried about that. But eh, one way or the other, I'll, I'll find a way of getting it played. I, I think the, the idea of the cards around the outside is fairly straightforward. But every time you play a card, you get to place one of your markers in the, the section where you're placing the card. And I think that idea of when to pull the trigger, maybe, you know, it's not overly complex, but it's one more thing you have to worry about. It's the, what cards do I have in my hand and where I can play them? And if it's, for example, if it is a, a run of cards and, you know, someone has played the, the five and you have the six, but there's only one spot left, do I need to play that six to claim that last spot, but then I'm out of the round, or can I, can I leave it for someone else to try and get that? And but then I won't get majority in the area, that type of thing. Um, the idea is not difficult. It's kind of the strategies are a little more, a little more complex than I was expecting. But it's definitely not a heavy game. Okay. Well, that gives me hope, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so now we're on to our ninety sevens. All right, my number ninety seven is another game that I guess I mean. I shouldn't say this because I'm assuming every game in your top 100 we've probably talked about at some point <laughs> in time, but I know for sure I've talked about this game repeatedly, not always in a glowing fashion. So you might question why it's on my top 100, but the game is Star Wars Rebellion. Star Wars Rebellion is a game that I initially enjoyed quite a bit. And I think I've said it before, with each passing play, I enjoy it less and less. Um and I equate it to, I use the example of, you know, the first time you see the Star Wars movie, you know, if you were a kid or whatever, even as an adult, you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. But if you go back and see it two, three, four, five, ten times, you're probably starting to see some flaws in the movie or maybe you're just bored with it. And that's kind of how I feel about the game. The game is, is two player. I mean, you can play it four player uh, with teams. I never have. I think maybe you can play it six, but um you know, it's it's basically a, a search and destroy. The Empire is trying to find the Rebel base. The Rebel base is trying to stay hidden. And you've got different characters in the game where you can do special missions and capture people and blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, you're building up your forces, almost like a risk style where you're, you know, you're building up certain um, certain types of ships roll this many dice and certain types of ship roll this kind of dice. And you have land troops, whatever. It, it's, it's not a hard game by any means. It's a long game. I mean, I... I I'd say it's probably it's every bit of two hours and maybe even longer than that, which for me, it's that's a long game for that type of game. But the reason it made the list and the reason it's it's been on the list. So 2016, it was 36. Then it went to 52. Last year it was 98. This year it's 97. Um, it, it just stays on it because my son enjoys playing the game a lot. I play it with him. And. And he finds some corny way. But um, yeah, that's Fantasy Flight Games, Star Wars Rebellion. I, it keeps hanging on. Yeah, I'm, su I'm actually surprised that this one's still on your list. Because I know we had talked about how this one has fallen off for you. But I mean, like you said, maybe next year you push it all the way up to like 99 or 100. We'll see. I, this, is, <laughs> this is another game I have that I've never played. Um, I was going to try and play this with B when he, he was still here, but unfortunately he's, he fled the country instead of playing this game with me. Um, <laughs> good choice B. Uh, I, as people know, I'm not, I enjoyed star Wars when it came out, but I'm not a star Wars. 
fan. And my wife, Lella, she's not a big Star Wars fan either. So this one, because of the game length and because neither one of us is really hugely interested in the source material, this is going to be a tough sale unless I find someone else to teach me this game. I believe I do have an offer on Twitter where someone's willing to uh, teach me this game. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Who was that? I believe it's my friend Andrew. He oh, said he okay. said he. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah make, don't worry. Make sure don't that worry. Wasn't me, like in some sort of, I would say drunken fit, but I don't drink so in some sort of like sugar, like low some, blood some pep- sugar moment. <laughs> some some Pepsi high. That's your height. Okay, so my number ninety-seven is uh, a game that, again, from twenty nineteen, a game that I still think very highly of, and it's the it's, game is called It's a Wonderful World. This is a little card game. It's a light card game. That the first time I played it, I really enjoyed it. It is a uh, an idea of kind of race for the galaxy, multi multi uh, use cards, which you're trying to build up buildings, and the first part you're going to be is drafting cards. But then you're going to decide what you're going to do with that card. Are you going to try and build it, or are you going to, are you going to discard it from your hand for the resources so you can build other cards? And once a card's in front of you, you can't discard it anymore. But you can you can you're trying to get resources to build those cards. And the way the game works is you will kind of do all this planning with your cards. So you draft and you plan, you know, I'm going to keep these cards, discard those cards, get the resources, I can put the resources directly on these buildings. And the buildings will say you're going to, you know, it requires four, four black resources and two red, uh, red resources. So you, from your discarded cards, you put the tokens on, but then you go through production and you go through production in order and it's always the same order i forget what the order is but let's say it's black first then yellow then red then green for example you could have some black buildings that will generate black that will generate resources you can take and then put on other buildings let's say a green building and if you put the last one on it then will start to produce in the green phase so you're trying to line everything up so you can say okay this one's going to be completed it's going to generate red and if i generate red then i can you know finish this building and this building is going to produce in the, in the yellow phase. So I do the black phase, do all that. I now have built a building. We go into the yellow phase and oh, this building I just built will now activate. Which I really enjoyed it. Really kind of uh, playing on um, the idea of building up a, a, these are very quick engines, but building up a, a quick engine and then getting these things built. So every turn, the resources you're getting are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And of course th- as you go on, the cards are getting more complex. Like the first cards may only take one or two resources, but they're really big point ones could be, you know, five, six, seven blue resources, which are harder to get. So you're trying to build up the engine so you can play these big, big point uh, scoring points at the end of the game. Um, or there could be cards with, you know, for every red building you have, you get this many points. So it's a game that it's fairly light. Uh, the game plays and I want to say about an hour hour and a half max but and because it is so quick and simple it's easy enough to explain the only uh, complicated part is the the production you're saying okay your buildings that are finished will produce now and you can use those resources to build other buildings and then those buildings will activate if they're complete in their phase so but beyond that it's a really enjoyable game i'm hoping they're going to come up with more cards because i've played it a fair bit that you know, you kind of seen the same cards again. So I'm hoping there's going to be expansions for this. I'm maybe there is. I haven't looked yet, but I'm looking forward to more for from It's a Wonderful World by number ninety seven. You're not gonna buy an expansion. Who are you what? kidding? I figured you buy the expansion. I buy the base set. Yeah, I, I've never played this one. I know. Uh, I know you took some some ribbing uh, when you. I think this was on your. Was this your number one for 2019? Uh, on one of the podcasts, yes. Okay, I thought it was, and I knew you took some ribbing, maybe from Eric, uh, because of how light it was or whatever. But um, I've never played it. It's uh, I mean, it sounds interesting. I don't know yeah. if it's that if it's that light. I mean, an hour, hour and a half seems a little long, but um, yeah, I would try it. And I, unfortunately, I don't think anybody's talking about this game. I really think it has fallen off the radar for a lot of people. When it came out, I was excited about it, but I really haven't seen. Uh, very many people talk about it. Oh, well. Yeah, I mean, other than you, and I, I think, I know Vassal talked about it, but other than that, I mean, 
I haven't heard, really heard anyone else, and certainly no one else is talking about it right now. So, but. All right, so my number 96 is a game that we argued about uh, over like one of our earliest podcasts uh, where you and I were together, We where we used to do the um, – uh, iron kitchen or sh- iron designer um, debates over take a topic and and argue or whatever or, or s- s- argue the, your points for the best game and rip the other person apart. And this was one I think it was for the economic um, subject, but the game is Pay Dirt. Pay Dirt, which was put out by Crash Games, uh, is all about gold mining, and it is it is a Euro game. It's a it's a worker placement game. You're upgrading your equipment. You're trying to get uh, find better pay dirt that's going to give you better yields on on gold. And it's um, I mean, no one talks about this game anymore. The company is out of business. I'm sure it's never going to see another print run. But I want to say the reason this game stood out to me initially is this is a it's not I think it's a Tory Layman design. No, ne- hold on. Don't quote. Yeah, uh, Tory Neiman. Tori Neiman, yes. I was thinking, uh, yeah. So it's a Tori Neiman design, and Tori Neiman is the gentleman who did Alien Frontiers, right? Is that I what I'm thinking? I believe so, yes. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that kind of stood out to me. I mean, it's a midweight Euro game, and it's a typical, um, you know, going to play about 90 minutes. It, You know, it's, if you like the, the theme, which I, I enjoy those gold, you know, those gold Russia shows on Discovery Channel and everything else. And if you like a Midway Euro, it's a nice, solid design. Um, even for a game that kind of came and went and is no longer, you know, even out there probably being played. It's still ranked pretty well on BGG. It's under 3000. So, um, and I know you've never played it. No. And, and so I don't, I mean. So far, <laughs> So far out of the uh, couple of games we've done so far, this is the first one I actually want to get played of yours anyway. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I mean, it's a Euro. I mean, it, you, it's a worker placement game. Um, it's hand management, some card. And then the other thing in it, which is, it's not, it's not like um, super punishing. It does have some auction and bidding because you are, you're going to um, have to be involved in an auction to get better equipment or upgrade your crew and stuff like that. So anyways, that is Pay Dirt by Crash Games. Good luck trying to find a copy. Um, I mean, I guess there's plenty of copies on the aftermarket, but you'll you'll probably never see it printed again. Yeah. Okay, so mine is a game that Dean and I played together. And the reason why this game is so low for me is because I've only got a chance to play it once. But it got me, um, it was my first introduction to coin games. This is a game called Pendragon, the Fall of Roman Britain. Um, now, if you've listened to the podcast, you know that I'm I'm a Euro gamer. I'm not a I'm not a war gamer. I know very little about war games. I've kind of dabbled my toes into about three war games, um, and I, I'm including Commands and Colors as a war game. It it is it's a war <laughs> game. Um, but I was nervous about a coin game because I heard that they were kind of complex and um, the. You know, it's more of a war game than what I was I was used to. Uh, and when I went down to ModCon, Dan had suggested that we play Pendragon. So I was like, oh, you know, I've, I've heard that they're going to be four to six, you know, hour games. And I, you know, do I, am I going to enjoy it enough to enjoy my, my time there? And we started playing it. And I think it was after four hours, both Dean and I looked at each other and was like, my God, I can't believe it's been four hours already because we were, I was having such a good time playing this. Um, since then I've actually, uh, got a copy of Pendragon for myself and I've actually played, uh, Cuba Libre mainly because of the enjoyment I got out of a coin game. And f- I still enjoy Pendragon out of the two that I've played. This is my favorite coin game. I wouldn't say this would be a good introduction to coin games because it is slightly more complex. I had the luxury of having someone teach me how to play. Um, and I think that a, that made the, the game better for me because I kind of understood what's going on and I love the, the main mechanism for uh, Pendragon and for Cuba Libre, which I, which I love, is you turn over the card and people, it will tell you what order people get to decide what they want to do in the card. So the card will say, okay, you know, the, the Roman Britons are, I forget who everybody is, all the, the, I know there's the Celts, there was the, whatever. They'll say, 
the Celts get to decide first whether they want to action this card. And do you want to do the full action or do you want to do the half action? If you do full action, then the second person in line can then do like a lesser action. But if you do a lesser action, then the other person can only do an... I can't remember exactly how those coin games. Or if you decide to pass, then it goes on to the next person on the list, and they, they get that same decision to do. Uh, Cuba Libre does the same type of thing. A card comes up, and you kind of look at the... Usually the person that's first, the, the event on it will be a pretty powerful event for that person. So, but if you do the event, then you're giving the next person in line a lot more options to do. You forego the event and say, okay, I want to action first, but I'm going to do a lesser amount. Then you're kind of reducing what the other people can do kind of down the line. And if you pass, well, will the next person want to do the, um, the full event or decision? But if I decide to take the action, I kind of go off to a staging thing. So the next card, I can't, um, I can't decide whether I'm going to take an action on. So it's, and it's area control. You're kind of pushing and pulling. You're trying to, um, depending, usually there's, there's a governmental side and the insurgency side. One side usually starts stronger than the other side, but it's this whole push and pull of, I'm going to move my troops in here. I'm going to try and ferret out the, you know, the, the local people. And then they start kind of rebellions and they're kind of popping up everywhere. And if you let them get too strong, then that's an issue. So like I said, I've only played one a game of Pendragon, which is why it's kind of low on my list. But I could definitely see that this is a game I want to get back to the table and I could see this rising higher the more I get to play this. So that is my 97, 6, 7, whatever, uh, Pendragon. Yeah, Pendragon was definitely a fun game. Um... Yeah, and again, I mean, time time went by uh, pretty darn fast in that because we were all pretty immersed in in, in trying to uh, not just stay on our toes of what we need to do, but to try to keep an eye on what everyone else was doing at the same time. Uh, it's probably not one that I'll buy, only because Dan has it, you have it, Eric now has a copy. Apparently, I saw on Twitter yesterday, so I don't think I need a copy. But um, for all the reasons that you say you loved Pendragon with the card play and then the choices. Um, that, that, that is coin. I mean, that, that is all the coins are going to play basically the, the same way as far as, you know, with the cards, card design, but, um, the different factions are always going to have some sort of not only in game that they, that they're striving for, but, um, you know, they're, they're all going to play, uh, pretty differently. So yeah, that's a, that, that's a good choice. I mean, pretty much any coin game probably be a good choice for a top 100, but I can see why you chose Pendragon. So speaking of, of a heavy game like coin games, uh, my number 95 is Sushi Go. Su uh, Sushi Go, the, uh, the card drafting set collection. Uh, it's been re-implemented, I think, by Sushi Go Party, which I have, but I don't think I've ever played it. But Sushi Go is a card game that, that for me, always, always seems to go over well. Play it with scouts, play it with family, play it with extended family at holidays. It is, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a fun little time. It is, it's a card drafting, like I said, where you know, you're passing card cards around the table, taking the ones you want. You're trying to build up some good, either sets or, um, um, try to get as many, uh, as much set collection as you can with different types of, of cards, whether it be tempore and, and, and some of the cards, you know, if you have the wasabi, then it doubles the points on something else. And you can have, you know, a combination of, whatever they call it, tempore and I forget what the, what the other ones are, Ma Maki rolls and stuff like that, but it plays fast. It's just a fun little silly uh, game. It, it makes a list because it's so easy to play. It's always enjoyable. And um, if you like card drafting games, it's, it's a really an easy one to introduce to people. So sushi go, that is one that uh, again, it's, it's, it's been there for a while. It's 69 to 79 to last year it was 95. Uh, so it's the same spot this year. Number 95. I would say uh, I don't own Sushi Go. I have played it. I've, I've enjoyed it. I would say if you're looking for an introductory um, drafting game, this has to be top of your list. And this is such a well-done drafting game. It's simple and it's a lot of fun. You know, the art's cute on it. And the idea of the set collection is kind of basic. Dumplings. You want, you want more dumplings than everybody else. Just that height, that idea. So lots of, that's a really good choice. Well, thank so, you. Yeah. So my number 95 is another new game. Um, this is a game called Res Arcana. Uh, this is a card playing game. 
and it's two to four players. Played it with more than two players, and I think I like it at two players best. Although higher player counts is, is just as good. It is a pretty exactly say standard uh, worker place uh, card game. There are four different resources that, of course, you're trying to collect to get better cards, and you you'll see that this theme pops up regularly on my on my top 100. I love these type of games where you are starting with kind of low uh, cards engine building. Start low cards, which produces you, which is you some res, um, some resources, so you can play your better cards to get better resources to kind of get the you know the big powerful cards. But you have a very limited set of cards you're playing with. And each game can be slightly different depending on who you pick and the, the cards that come with that. And if you like if you like card games with engine building in them, think uh, Race of the Galaxy or as I talked before, It's a Wonderful World, um, Res Arcane has to be right in there. Um, this now has an expansion for it called Lux and... The full name is Lux and something. And it's by... This game is by Tom Lehman. You may see his name pop up later on in my top 100 games of all time. But, yeah. <laughs> so this is my number 95. Res Arcana, again, it came out in 2019. If you haven't got a chance to, to to try it, I would say if you like card games, if you like Tom Lehman's other games, definitely give Res Arcana. Yeah, another one of those that I haven't played. Um, and I know, I mean, it got pretty good, uh, pretty good reviews when it came out last year. So I definitely would like to try it. I don't know if I'd go buy it because I might have a card crafting or what was a deck construction i guess deck construction game on uh on my list as well so but yours isn't really deck construction though is no it's it? not no okay all right my number where am i at 94 my number 94 is a uh, another world war ii themed game and this one is d-day dice this i have the original version d-day dice i don't know how much different the second edition is it just came out um, it probably isn't a whole lot different, but D-Day Dice is a game where I've only ever played it solo. I used to take it on the road with me a lot, but you have different little boards that will present you with the scenario for that game. And you, you have a certain number of, of, um, men at your disposal. You can gain more, you can gain reinforcements depending on the cards that are drawn or that you purchase. Uh, depending on which side of the battlefield you go, because ultimately you're making choice, go left, go right, go up the middle, do this, do that. And each different section of the board is going to have prerequisites. Well, I need to have a, you know, I need to have a, a radio man, or I need to have someone with engineering equipment, or I need to have this specific type of equipment. So it's going to kind of um, help you make your choice, which way you want to go, uh, which side will be easier for you. And then, of course, you know, ultimately to get to the very end, you're trying to, you know, to take out whatever it is, the bunker or capture this point or whatever. It's a lot of dice rolling. It's a typical solo game where it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be a very luck dependent, really. I mean, you can mitigate some of the luck by the, the stuff that you purchase or the, or the reinforcements that you get. But um, if you don't like, you know, if you don't like a, a dice chucking um, luck dependent solo game, then you're probably not going to like this one. I like it because I like the theme. I like I like how it plays, and it plays quick. And you can play it, sit sit there, not put a lot of brain power into it, and, and you know investing into it. And um, for me, that that's a plus when I'm on the road. So that is D Day Dice, and I can't remember. I don't. I, it's a different company that put out the second edition. So I apologize. I don't know who that is off the top of my head. But another one of those that went from uh, 21 to 84 to 97 and then now 94 and i think it's primarily because i just don't take it on the road with me nearly as much as i used to i've got other solo games and um you know you, i gotta i gotta try to keep up with the fresh hot stuff so <laughs> d-day dice kind of gets pushed to the back yeah this is a game i know almost nothing about yeah i mean i'm not a big world war ii fan um i don't know how many people actually are fans of wars but you know it's it's not something not a time in history that interests me that much. Well, okay, so you don't need to be a fan of the war. <laughs> so I, I, I like the time period. I like the history involved in it. It's not like I'm rooting and cheering for people to die. Yeah, I mean, and had, had Canada even been involved in World War II, I mean, maybe you'd enjoy it. I mean, I think you guys sat out you know, the whole time, right? Were you guys okay. even in it? 
Okay, we will go on to my 94. <laughs> <laughs> so my 94 is a um, Eurowee game with dice, and this is a game called, I'm going to butcher the name, La Grangia? Ra Grangia? Gr Grangia? No. Don't Something ask like me. That. Um, it is a Euro game. You are, you know, building up a farm. You need to get more fields. You need to get your, your, basically your, your fruits and vegetables to the market. But the, the thing I really like about this game is you, on your player board, you have kind of three slots at the bottom and two slots on the top. And you're going to be sliding cards in there. So the cards will have stuff on the top and stuff on the bottom. So where you, where you, how you slide it in will determine what that card's going to be used for. Uh, this is a game all about timing. And timing for this game is, is critical. Um, you need to be doing stuff at the right time. There's a bit of drafting uh, in here. Uh, there's a siesta track as well. Also determining what turn order you should be going in is critical. So it's one of these games when it's it's only six rounds. and But you need to be watching what everybody's doing. And I quite often enjoy that with games. I like games where you need to be, it's not a, a solitaire game. I'm not just kind of building up my own farm. I need to be knowing what Dean is doing. So, do, you know, do I need to jump in front of him something? Do I need to deliver something something more for him? Do I need to make sure that I, next turn, I need to go before he does, so I need to manipulate the, the turn order track. Um, it's a lot of fun. It is a, when this game first came out, a lot of people were talking about it. it's definitely is on, a, on the uh, heavier side of Euro games. When the dice version came out, one of the few times when I thought that the dice version was just as good as the original um, Euro game. Dice version is definitely faster, but still gives it the same type of feel about, you know, wheelbarrows and food and getting it to the market and all that. But um, the original, because I'm I enjoy the Euro game more, this is the one that made my list as opposed to the dice game. It's actually a surprise. It's now six years old. I didn't realize it was that old, but yeah, that is my number 94, uh, La Grania. Yeah, that's, it's funny because that's a game that I picked up at Origins the year it came out. I think it was supposed to come out at Essence. I think Origins had just a few copies. And for whatever reason, I was, I got to the Stronghold booth and I don't know what I was there to buy. It wasn't La Granja. It was... I don't know, whatever it was. And so I was making the purchase and of course they're like, oh, I guess you want a copy of Lugar. I'm like, hey, yeah, sure, whatever. I'm like, you know, because it was, I don't know, maybe 35, 40 bucks. It wasn't an expensive game when it first came out. And I never played it, never took it out of the shrink, never did anything with it. And then last year, I think someone online offered me a pretty good chunk of change. So I ended up selling it without ever, <laughs> without ever playing it. I had the dice version of it, and I know you had said that it's a better implementation, so it probably uh, persuaded me to sell it. But yeah, it was kind of a fluke that I had it. But yeah, and I, I will say that the, the one of the designers, Andreas uh, Odenhall, um, he now goes by the the name Ode O D E. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a couple other games. He's done at least one other game that's on my list as well, and he tends to do heavier Euro games. So if you enjoy heavier Euro games, I mean, he's probably one person you want to keep out. And he normally does extremely tight Euro games where they can be kind of punishing it. But luckily, this is one of his earlier games where he didn't feel like punishing everybody. So this one's more, this one is more approachable. Yeah, and I wonder if this one, because, I mean, it's, it demands a pretty good price on the aftermarket. I'm trying to, I wonder if they've ever done a reprint of it. I mean, you'd think you'd have to in six years. But maybe it didn't sell. Yeah. Um, maybe it didn't sell as well. But I'd have to look into it and see. But it definitely doesn't seem like there's any new copies floating around. All right. My number 93 is a game that, you know, you talked about Pendragon and, and because it's a coin game. My number 93 is not a coin game. No matter what people say, no matter how much they profess it to be. I will argue it's not a coin game, but it's still a good game. It's still a heavy game. It's still a game that has asymmetrical powers, and that is Root. Root is, um, you know, it, it's it's a cold whirly design. It is a difficult game to master for sure, and I know it's a difficult game for someone to teach because <laughs> <laughs> only because of the of the asymmetrical design. Because not only do you, do you need to know how your faction plays or my faction plays, I've, you've got to know what everyone else's faction does as well. Cause you have to be able to counter that. 
And while it sounds simple, like, okay, I just can just, I can just focus on the birds because that's what I'm playing. No, you need to know what the other factions, how they work so you can counter what they're doing in the game. Because it is definitely a, um, it's definitely a game where if someone gets out in the front, it's going to take down the king style of play. You're going to have to make temporary alliances to take the other person out to hopefully give you enough time to, to uh, win the game. And the interesting, I think, the interesting thing I like about the game is that you have the vagabond, the raccoon, and it's just it's a, it's a very solo style of play, and he interacts with all the different factions, but it's almost like it's it's basically like a built-in timer because if someone else doesn't win the game, eventually the the vagabond's going to win. It's just going to win by default based off basically off the time because it's going to keep progressing. But the Vagabond can also make alliances and they can team up with people and help take people down as well. So it's it's pretty interesting design for sure. The reason I say it's not a coin game is for all the reasons Graham said, the crux of the coin game is the card play. It's the different events. It's the jockeying of who gets to do what at any time. That's not in route. I mean, there's no I mean, there's cards, but, you know, it's not like they're not event cards. All right, the Vagabond plays a card for a re- specific reason. The the Eerie has their engine building that they have to do with their cards. But it's not like if I play this card, it gives someone else a, a, a better advantage. And so that's where I disagree with that it's a coin game. Yes, there are asymmetrical powers and you are jockeying around, but uh, I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't agree that it's a coin game. And I know people, and I think the reason people say it is because for the non-wargaming people in the hobby that I'm going to piss people off, but I know it sounds really cool to say, Oh yeah, I played root and you know, I played a coin game. It's not really a coin game. So stop. I would, I would agree with you. I mean, I've only played two coin games, but the, the card play that event thing of making that decision and where, whether you're going to use it or not is not in root. And for me, that's why I define this a coin game is that, that those event cards. Um, now root is a completely asymmetrical game. And each person plays differently. And I do think that the different animals suit different play styles. And teaching it, yes. If you've never taught the game before, and you're trying to teach three other people how to play the game, you have to learn what the game is about, how the game works, and then how each faction works, and be able to explain all the different factions. Yeah, that was a, that was a bear to teach that day. So, oh, I, I, I thought it was fine. <laughs> Uh, so my number 93 probably wouldn't be on my list. Uh, well, I know it was not on my list before. And the only reason why it's on my list now is because I've actually played it a fair bit in the last two, three months since we've been in lockdown. Because it's a game that's on Battle Arena. Oh, sorry, I always call it Battle Arena. Or Game Arena. This is an older game, and it's a good introductory kind of worker placement game, and it's a game called Stone Age. Uh, I had not played this one in a couple of years until, again, I've played it probably four or five times in the last month, uh, or two months. And I just realized what a good, solid game Stone Age is. And I'm still having lots of fun uh, with it. And this is just playing the base game. The, as I, because I played it so often in this short period of time, I, I am starting to see some of its flaws. And if, you, if you've never played Stone Age, you start off with uh, six, five people. I think it's five workers or six workers. I forget what the actual number is. But there are locations on the board that you're going to send them. And uh, most of the places like to get wood or to get rock or uh, brick or gold, there's only a certain number of spots you can go to. So let's say there's seven spots. Well, you may put three people, then maybe Dean will put four people there. When we resolve it, you'll go, okay, I want to get some wood. And the wood will be, I think wood is three to one. So every person you put there, you're going to roll a die for that person going to divide the total by three for wood and for if you go all the way up to gold gold is six so you're going to divide whatever total you have by six and that's how much gold you have and you want to get that gold or those resources to be able to complete either some buildings so there could be some buildings that say okay if you have you know a, a stone a wood and a gold this is going to be worth five points so you turn that in you take that and then a new one comes out there's also some i think they're called development cards or something like that which could give you end of game scoring like for every for every three meeples you have you're going to score a point those type of things but there are three smaller areas on the board which are kind of the, the village and one is the 
I'm not exactly sure what the official name is. It's often referred to as the love hut because you put two people there and when you pull them off, you get a third person. Uh, there's also a way that you can increase the amount of food you get per round. So it's like a permanent food you can get or you can get a, uh, what's called an axe, which allows you to manipulate some dice. Because at the end of every round, you have to feed all your people. But I noticed through all my plays that the those three village areas are always the first three to go. Well, technically, you can only there's only two out of the three that are going to go. But it's almost always for the first three quarters of the game, people are just like, I'm going to take food. Next person, I'm going to get an axe. Therefore, the love hut's empty. Next round, I'm going to the love hut. I'm going to the axe. So the food can't be taken. And then people start to put, position themselves around all the resources. It's a, you know, if you're looking for a, I wouldn't exactly want to say a first step, but if you're looking for a, you know, a nice light hero game that's still got a lot of player interaction because there's only limited so many spots you can go to. So if I put all my people in wood, no one else is getting wood. So if you really need wood, or if I see you're trying to collect wood or gold or whatever else to get a, a high player, uh, you know, a high point uh, end of scoring thing, I I want to maybe steal it before you do. A lot of fun. And because it is so, it's a simpler game, the strategies are pretty straightforward. You know that if you want to get one of those buildings and it requires wood, gold, and stone, then you know you need to send your people out to get that. That's it. I mean, there's, there's no complicated things of getting this to convert it to this, to convert it to that, to buy this, you know, to buy this building, which will generate gold. No, so you go gold, you roll dice. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. That's my one downside of it too, is the dice rolling. Because if you know me, I, I have a really good habit of rolling ones. Um, so it doesn't matter how many ones I roll, I just won't be able to get a, uh, a, a single measly bar of gold. I don't think it's that difficult. But that is my... Uh, that is my number 93, Stone Age. Yeah, Stone Age is always one of those games that everyone touts as being a great gateway game or an introductory worker placement game, and and I don't disagree with that. Um, I haven't played it in quite a while, but I've always enjoyed the plays that I've had of it. Um, and then I would definitely, I don't know, I'm trying to think if there's an app for it. There might be, but I would definitely play Stone Age uh, just about any time someone wanted to, because even though it's, it's simple enough to introduce to people. There's still enough going on in the game to keep, you know, to keep a, a, a grizzled uh, gaming veteran uh, happy while they're playing it as well. So that's a good choice. Okay, my number 92 is a game that is, it's new to the list. Um, I haven't had it on my list before. And that's because I think the first, the only times I played it was in 2019. But that is a game called Rococo. Um, now I know they're putting out a new deluxe edition of it. I didn't back it on Kickstarter and I don't own the original version of it cause I wasn't willing to pay that price and I'm okay with that. I mean, I, it's a nice solid design. It's a nice solid game to play, but I've played it, you know, a few times now and I've enjoyed it, but I don't think I need to own it. I can just play it if someone else has a copy, um, so I don't even know if it, it – maybe it may not even make it on the list next year. Um, it may have just made it on here be, this year because I've played it a few times. I did enjoy it. But I can see this being one where maybe if you keep playing it over and over again, the thrill will kind of wear off because it's a solid game. It's not a spectacular game. But uh, Rococo is is really, for me, the, the, uh, the most enjoyable factor of it is the hand management aspect of this game. I like being able to kind of plan who I'm going to use – out of my hand and it's, it's your choice. You're not at the, you're not at the fate of, of a, you know, random draw off of your pile. Um, so for me, I think that's the most interesting part. Other than that, it's a pretty standard set collection. Um, you're, you're getting resources, you're getting different fabrics to be able to craft different dresses. And yes, this is a game about dressmaking, but, um, you're crafting different gowns for the balls. Some gowns are going to be worth more uh, points than others or different colors. And then if you get them into, there's like three levels of, of the palace. I think you're trying to put your, your uh, dresses on people and then put them into those areas. And that comes down to the area majority control um, aspect of the game. You're trying to um, either have area control or at least meet the, um, the requirements for the, um, for the area that you're in. Then of course, the higher up that you go in the palace to the area with the fireworks, you know, the, the more points you can get. 
it's not a difficult game by any means to understand. Um, yeah, I mean, there's strategy, don't get me wrong, but it's not like this is going to be a, a, you know, a four, a four for a weight. I mean, it says it's a little over a three. Eh, maybe, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of a midweight Euro game, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's fine. I mean, it's a solid, solid game. I know that's not a ringing endorsement to be on a top 100 list, but again, I think it's on my list this year because I played it, you know, probably four or five times last year and I enjoyed each play. So it probably was very fresh in my mind when I was making my list. Yeah, this is a game I, I played, I think once with you 2019 and I enjoyed my play. It won't make my top uh, 100 games of all time because I'm like you, I thought it was a good midweight Euro game, but there's an awful lot of good midweight Euro games out there that this one to me, I won't be rushing out to buy the original version and, and didn't back it on uh, Kickstarter. I enjoyed it. If so, someone wants to play, I'd happily play this game, but I don't need this game in my collection. And I don't think it's, well, I, I can almost guarantee you that it's not on my top 100 games of all time. <laughs> right. Well, again, I think the reason it made my list is because I, I did play it multiple times last year. And so I think it was just fresh in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like what Stone Age was for me. Um, yeah, it wouldn't have made my list before, but I played it a couple of times. I enjoyed my plays of it. So, it, you know, it made my, my top 100. So my number 92 is a solo game, solo game on Graham's list. Yes. This what? is, uh, I believe one of only two solo games on my, uh, top 100 games. <laughs> I was going to guess it, but I'm like, well, I think you've only played one, but go ahead. Uh, so this one is called Nemo's War. Ah, wrong one. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you know what the other one is and it will be higher on my list. Uh, but Nemo's War, I'd owned this game for quite a while. Uh, because I'd heard the buzz around it, but I never got a chance to play it. Well, I finally got it to the table and boy, is it a lot of fun. Um, again, it's lower on my list because I haven't really got a chance to dig, you know, have multiple, multiple plays of it. Uh, this may go higher because what I have played of it, I've really enjoyed. It is definitely a, it's, it's not a, a five to 10 minute solo game. There's one you're just going to roll out, you know, pull out, roll a couple of dice, whatever else. There's, there's a significant amount of setup to it. And the game, I think I played an hour and a half, two hours, and I, I lost um, quite badly. In some ways, it kind of reminds me of Pandemic. You have ships kind of coming onto the board that you're going to be drawing out of a, a bag or whatever else. And you kind of think, oh, you know, one, one ship's in this ocean. That's fine. And then halfway through the game, you're going, oh boy, I better do something about these ships because... Uh, I'm getting out of losing places where I can put them. And when you can't put them, then you gotta, you've got to put them in adjacent areas. And if you can't put them in adjacent areas, uh, I, think you flip, I think you flip over to make them, the ships harder. And there's like, there's a, a countdown in your, uh, there's a, a counting timer that when that reaches a certain point, the game's over. You have uh, an objective at the beginning of the game, depending on which one you want to do. It could be like explore, or there could be a, you know, a more military version that you want to play and it will tell you how you win the game where to set up all the counters and all that but every time you do a roll you have to kind of decide on do you want to not exactly exhaust but you have three tracks you have a crew track you have a ship track and you have the nemo track the the, the captain's track so do i spend one of those people to try and boost up my die roll which will be fine if you're successful then you you don't lose that but if you're unsuccessful then you you move your time you move those tickers down and of course if those go all the way to the bottom you've lost as well but sometimes you really really need to pass the test so uh you know do you commit that uh those extra resources that you could lose but the benefit is is also really good and what you do you can go looking for treasures you can go do adventures you can go fight the merchant ships or the military ships but if you do merchant ships and your reputation goes down because you're killing innocent people Lots of fun, lots of different things to do. This is one I definitely want to get back to the table. Um, yeah, Nemo's War. Just I was surprised how much I enjoyed the solo game. That is my number 92. Yeah, Nemo's War is one where uh, I bought, I backed it on Kickstarter a long time ago, and I took it with me on the road, and I set it up, and um, but then I, I just got really busy, so I never got to play it. So I sat there for like two weeks, and I ended up picking it up and putting it back away. And I don't think I've ever actually played a full game of it. 
Um, I do. I went out and bought like three of the expansions for it. The little, they're just little deck expansions um, because I, I definitely want to explore the game. And, and I know you've said good things about it. And I think Eric um, has played it and enjoyed it as well. But uh, and I like the theme. I, I like the whole Nemo and the Nautilus and and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah, it, that, that's probably a good choice. I can't I can't say it's a bad choice because I haven't played a full game of it. But um, now you make you make me want to go dig it out of storage and and get it played. Oh. All right, my number ninety one, last one for this list is another light game. Uh, it's a card game and it's called The Game. The game, I think there's a newer implementation, like the game on fire, maybe. I just have the original one. Um, I think mine actually were, my original one I think I got with just the German rules. I had to print out the the English rules, but very simple card game. And it, it probably has had different forms or iterations over the years, uh, probably with family games or whatever. But you have a uh, you have a deck of, I think, 100 cards. And the goal is you're, you can play it solo. Or you can play it with with multiple players. If you're playing multiplayer, the goal is everyone's going to have a hand of cards. Let's say it's five because I don't remember the top of my head. So you have five cards. On your turn, you must play at least two of the cards out of your hand onto the board. On the board, you're going to have um, four areas that you can play into. Two of the areas you have to play in ascending order. Two of the areas you have to play in descending order. And so, of course, the, the point is, or the, the goal is to try to play cards as close to the card that's face up down in the area because you don't want to leave big gaps where then other people can't play cards. So you can choose to play up, you can choose to play down. Um, and then there's a special rule, rule that if you have the card that's exactly 10 higher or lower, depending on which column or which row you're going to play into, you can do that. So then you can either bump it up or, or bump it back to kind of kind of um, give, give your partners more wiggle room. And then, of course, if you're playing multiplayer, you cannot speak. You cannot. Well, you can speak. You just you can't say specifically what card you have in your hand. As people are playing cards, you can say, OK, I prefer no one else play there. Um, it, but you can't get into the specifics of what you have in your hand. I've always enjoyed it. This game has gone over extremely well. Um, much like Sushi Go with in-laws, with scouts, with family. I think I own three copies of it now because I have a copy I take on the road. We have a copy that we put in the camping stuff. Nolan has a copy because he was always stealing it out of the camping stuff to take to his friends. Um, so he has a copy as well. And yeah, you know, maybe because I think I maybe I bought a copy and gave it to to uh, Amy's aunt and uncle as well. But it's just always it's always so easy to teach, and it's it's. It's just so easy to play. I mean, I played in my hotel room quite a bit, just sitting there in front of the TV, you know, flipping cards and and uh, trying to uh, trying to win. But yeah, I, I think I don't even know who puts it out. I think Abacus Spiel is the one that I have, but there's there's a lot of different publishers for it, and um, it was pretty hard to get originally. Like I said, I had the German version. Now I think you can get it pretty easily here, in uh, in North America. So that is the game. Yes, it's difficult to find on Board Game Geek because it's just called the game, and there's there's very many, uh, lots of games that have the game in their title. And I will say, so the the picture I've I've shown here is the the copy that I have and Dean has. This is the the German version of it. I believe, and if you look at it, I don't know why they did this, but it's kind of got this red skull on the the package. And it, if you're looking for a family game, you might that may be turn you off. I believe the newer versions now have a flower theme on. Now a, a white box with different looks or pastel flowers and whatnot. Um, still the same game because there was the game there. Then they came out with a game on fire, which is a, I think it adds a variant or it adds a couple extra cards to the game. I, I've mm -hmm. never played that one, but Dean introduced me to the game and we played it a lot. And then when we got home from the con after Dean had taught it to us, because Lella was there as well, we, we bought a copy. We've introduced it to a lot of people. I know at least one of our friends has looked for a copy of the game so that he could play it with his family and, and friends as well. Uh, it's gone over really well because it is, it's so simple. And it's that whole, you can't talk. And when you're getting down to like, you know, you have a couple cards in your hand and you're like, okay, I, we are, we're going up and we're at 91 already. There's not a lot of space, but oh, look, I now have the 81 and 71. You know, as long as no one plays on this, this pile, I'm good. So you say, they don't touch this pile. Someone else around the table say, okay, and don't touch that pile. Someone else will say, don't touch that pile and that pile. 
and you're like, but I have to play a card. I'm going to do. I'm going to screw up someone's uh, someone's turn. But All it's right. it's a lot of fun. And you know what? Quite often it is you, you play it and you lose and you shuffle back up and you start again. So yeah, that that's a really good choice. Well, good. I'm glad you agree. So my number 91 is a, my party game for the list. This is a one I believe that came out in 2019 as well. And this was introduced to us by another one of our friends, Dustin. Uh, it's a game called Just One. And this is the game where you are, uh, it's a word game. And you are going to hold up a, so if I'm the guesser, I'm going to hold up a card so I can't see it, but I'll, everybody else can. And I can't remember whether I roll a die or pick. I'll say number three, for example. And let's say it's the word spaghetti. I put, it, I put it down, cover my eyes, turn away, whatever else. And everybody else has like a little plaque where they're going to be writing a one word uh, clue. So you guys want me to guess spaghetti. It's a cooperative game. So you guys are trying to write down stuff that will make me guess spaghetti. When everybody's written down, they reveal it to everybody else around the, uh, around the group. So everybody who's written stuff will show each other what they've written. And if anybody has the same clue as someone else, you turn those face down and me as the guesser won't see it. So you want to give clues that are maybe not as obvious, but will still get me guess spaghetti. And then when you say you're ready, I turn around and just see whatever's left. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, what word am I trying to guess? It's a whole lot of fun. Again, this is one that's gone over very well. I think it works better with more players. So the higher player account definitely works better because there's more chance of you doubling up with someone. But then you are thinking, well, everybody knows this is the obvious one, so no one's going to write it. So should I write the obvious one? Because I don't think anyone else is going to write the obvious one to try to help the guesser out. Because sometimes you turn over and you're some completely obscure, you know, stuff. You're going, I have no idea how this stuff is connected. So what you can see, you're trying to connect what people have written to make you guess the word. Again, a lot of fun, very quick. I, again, it's a cooperative game and I believe you're trying to get through a certain number of cards or you're trying to, you have, let's say it's seven cards and you're trying to get like five out of the seven to win or something like that. I forget what the exact numbers are, but you are all trying to work together. So it's a really fun group party game that's over in 20 minutes, very easy to play, but the amount of laughs I've had over this as well, it's just, that's why it's my number 91 on my list. Yeah, that that's a great choice. And I, I forgot how many, it's like 11 cars, 13 cars, something like that. Cause you have the, if you guess wrong, you like what burn two cards, yes. maybe. And you, you can pass and only burn one, I think. Yeah. Cause you either, you either successfully guess you pass if you have no clue or you guess and it's completely wrong. And, you know, those are the kind of three stages. So you're trying to, you're trying to make your points, I guess, positive. We're trying to have more cards in the pass pile than your right. discard pile. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those, that uh, um, you know, the more players you have, the, the, the more fun it is. But it's another one of those kind of like a code names where, depending on the generation of the people playing. So we played at Thanksgiving. And, of course, you know, so we had teenagers to, I don't know, geriatrics <laughs> to what one foot in the grave and like some of the clues that you would get made like, I mean, to the person that gave it to you, they made total sense. But when you're the one trying to guess the word, you're like, okay, okay, I get, I kind of see where these are connected. I'm like, what is this? I don't even know <laughs> what this is in reference to. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's kind of interesting in it. And then it's also one of those where you talked about, you know, do you, you don't want to give a super easy common clue cause someone else may give it, but I'll tell you what, I don't know how many times I thought, man, this would be the perfect clue, but no, definitely someone else is going to write it. And no one writes it because they all think the same thing. And then, it, you know, maybe it would have been the one that got, got the person to guess correctly. So there's always that, that kind of guessing and second guessing. Should I do this one? This is going to be too hard or this is too obscure or, you know, for sure someone's going to have this one. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great game. It's a lot of fun. So I think that wraps up. Well, I know that wraps up our first 10 games of our top 100 games of all time. Um, yeah, we will be back hopefully soon to record our next one and get the next one out. And we haven't quite decided what the release schedule is going to be. Maybe one a week, a couple a week. I'm not sure. This was our, our first attempt at doing this. Took some growing pains, but I think we got there in the end. So yeah, I guess until next time, thanks for watching. See ya.